just don't view it as coffee see it as like another coffee tasting caffeinated hot beverage and then it's like it's quite good like i genuinely enjoy it that's not good this is wrong no Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze. Ah, as always, I'm your host, Simon Wammers here, Danny Rice, me script, UK food versus USA food, fizzy lemonade wars. Okie dokie. Oh, because we talked about this previously. And Americans, their, their lemonade is flat. <laughs> what, no bubbles? Are you crazy? Bubbles? Nope. Bubbles? I'm not listening. Forever never blowing bubbles. It was the closing line in our recent video on bizarre American habits that got people on both sides of the Atlantic scratching their heads in bewilderment. Americans don't even know that lemonade should be fizzy. And I think I mentioned that to me, Sprite, which is a, a drink I believe, or 7-Up, is a drink that Americans probably have. Yes, that is a lemonade. We would call that lemonade in the UK. Like If you went to a, a place and you said, I'll have a lemonade, they would bring you a Sprite or a 7-Up or if you know some sort of cloudy, sparkly lemonade, something like that. Excuse me, what are you doing? From the US perspective, nobody could understand why you would need to put bubbles in a perfectly good glass of lemonade. And from the UK perspective, we can't understand why anyone in their right minds would be serving flat lemonade. But which side is getting it hopelessly wrong? It's the American. <laughs> Now that I think about it, a lot of things suddenly begin to make sense to me. For example, I was always puzzled by the quintessentially American tradition of young children running homemade lemonade stands on their front gardens. It's a health and safety violation! <laughs> and uh, also, I did think, like, well, they got some soda stream back there to carbonate the water? <laughs> you don't usually find that in the UK. If British kids were selling anything on their front gardens, it would be stink bombs, knuckle dusters, and cupcakes sprinkled with dog treats and snot. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> but yeah, I never understood how the American kids were making carbonated drinks. Do they have easy access to carbonation machines? Do American kitchens come plumbed with a third fizzy water tab as standard? A friend of mine put one of those into his house. <laughs> he was like, he loves, he just loves fizzy water and soda stream and shit like that. And he was like, it's really expensive to do like the, the soda stream where you do the bottles and it's a hassle. So he's just getting some sister. I don't know if he's finished putting it in yet, but it's just like there's a tap on the thing. And then underneath he's got like a proper carbon dioxide machine with a big canister of carbon dioxide that he uses which lasts for ages and that's really clever i'd be into that No, it turns out they're not making proper lemonade. Whereas the UK version of lemonade is a bottle of glorious effervescence that we buy in stores, the US version is something you're more likely to rustle up at home with lemon juice, water, and sugar. Which I have to say does sound a lot more like lemonade, doesn't it? Rather than like coke it's like it's similar to coke it's like sprite and i have to admit that if i handed over good money at a lemonade stand only to be served with lifeless flat rubbish i'd throw it right back in the kids faces and demand a refund we can't seem to agree on a name for carbonated drinks hailing from the north of england i'd be inclined to label them busy pop no what do we we call it uh soft drinks soft drinks which is weird because they're not soft, <laughs> they're busy. Whereas big chunks of the US would go with soda, some parts of the southern United States weirdly use the term Coke to describe every soft drink, not even, even the stuff that's not Coke, really? But a big part of the reason why a UK customer may feel aggrieved at the idea of being missold a flat lemonade is because we expect anything suffixed with aid to be fizzy. Oh, that's true. Yeah, like cherry aid, other aids. <laughs> Ask for aid, and you shall receive. Whether it's lemonade, cherry aid, orange aid, banana aid, what the f is that? No one wants that. The only drink that bananas should be served in is a smoothie. These final three letters deliver an expectation of fizzy bubbles every time. Getting served a flat lemonade would be akin to getting served a cold cup of tea. Iced tea. I rather like iced tea. Except America wouldn't mind that because they drink iced tea and coffee over there. It's as if it's perfectly natural to shove ice into a traditionally hot beverage. I iced tea's great. I love iced tea. Just black iced tea with a little bit of sugar. That's that's some good shit right there. However, although lemonade has been around since 1630, it wasn't traditionally carbonated, largely because the water carbonation process hadn't been invented yet. The original recipe of sparkling water, lemon juice, and honey made its debut in Paris, where lemonade peddlers would wander the streets while dispensing cups of lemonade from giant tanks strapped to their back. That sounds just warm and horrible. Drinks should be served cold. Although Danny previously made it up, he's like, no, nah, just room temperature. I'm like, you weirdo, Danny. You f weirdo. No offense, Danny, I love you. You weird, buddy. You're weird. 
It was the Yorkshireman Joseph Priestley who first invented a contraption for making carbonated water in 1767, and it was German Swiss watchmaker Johann Schwepp who delivered a practical process for producing bottled carbonated drinks in 1786. This led to most of the world embracing fizzy lemonade as standard, but for some reason the US preferred to stick with the original homemade recipe. It can get very confusing when ordering your favorite lemonade, lemony tipple overseas. A lot of Americans tend to think that fizzy lemonade is essentially just Sprite, but that's an entirely separate lemon and lime beverage the uk wait didn't i just spend the entire first half of this video describing sprite as lemonade daddy sprite is lemonade isn't it <laughs> the uk version of flat lemonade is sometimes known as cloudy lemonade but that's what yeah that's also fizzy cloud fizzy cloudy lemonade is i love Sp i don't really i don't like sprite i find and i don't want to ruin sprite for people but it kind of smells like the same stuff that you'd use to clean in my opinion whereas seven up is the jam like seven up is that i just like seven up um i don't i never see diet seven up so i pretty much never drink it um i don't know why diet seven up isn't a more common thing because i would just be drinking that constantly why not put why not get seven up diet throw a little bit of caffeine in there brilliant beverage why not Still, it's not quite as confusing as in Belgium, where you can order a lemonade at a bar and end up with a fizzy orange drink. Oh yeah, this is in, in Czech as well. Like, lemonade doesn't mean it's with lemon, and it doesn't mean it's fizzy. Sometimes it's fizzy. You could order lemonade. You order lemonade, you'd be like, yeah, I'll have a lemonade, please. And they're like, oh, what flavor do you want? <laughs> and it sounds counterintuitive, because you'd be like, yeah, lemon. <laughs> It's like, no, we have like a raspberry, orange, mango, lemon, and you'd be like, yeah, lemon. <laughs> you have to specify. And it's not like the other drinks contain lemon. They just, it's like a sort of cordial style drink that they just call lemonade. When life gives you lemons, you make orange Fanta. Rogue marshmallows. There are several places you might typically expect to find marshmallows growing naturally by the marshes. Note check to self before submitting to <laughs> But getting roasted on the end of a fork by a campfire, or in my case, I'd usually find them bobbing around in a bowl of Lucky Charms. Surely the greatest and most colorful, if not the healthiest, breakfast cereal to ever grace the aisles of the supermarket. Wait, Danny, did you suddenly become American? I don't think I've ever had Lucky Charms. I just assumed that was an American thing. Isn't I thought that was an American cereal my whole life? Marshmallows to me had put in like hot chocolate or roast on a campfire. I know the Americans then put them. I went camping with an American friend of mine and he's like putting them between a biscuit with some chocolates. And I'm like, this is needlessly complex, but actually delicious. They're called s'mores? Schmores? I often wondered if eating marshmallows and milk for breakfast was bordering on the slightly odds, but we can go odder than that. Because I'll tell you one place where I really wouldn't expect to find marshmallows is dumped all over a pile of sweet potatoes and served up as a side dish to a main course. What the f? What? You think you know, but you have no idea. And yet, how? I have not even heard of this. I mean, I feel like I've heard of weird American food. And yet, this so-called sweet potato casserole has been a staple of the American Thanksgiving dinner table for well over a century. To be honest, I don't even like sweet potatoes or yams, if you insist. Uh, no, we don't insist. Sweet potatoes. Sweet potatoes are f delicious, Danny. And you know the crazier thing? They're apparently healthier than regular potatoes. Sweet potatoes are the shizzle, man. I love that. But the idea of taking something that's already quite sweet and then pouring loads of confectionery all over it just doesn't sound very side dish to me. Sickeningly sweet dessert for strange children, maybe, but I just keep that stuff well away from the roast turkey and the gravy. Particularly if you want to avoid your gravy evolving into a sticky marshmallow contaminated goo. Dude, that's, this sounds horrible. This sounds horrible, but. Bing, 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 bong, 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 bong. Get those lights off! Bing, 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 bing. I, 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 I have to say, I've got to learn my, to hold my tongue with American food stuffs and weird combinations. Like, I've never tried peanut butter and jelly, or as we call it, like um, jam in a sandwich together, because that just sounds rough. But I should try it because it's probably going to taste good. Because um, when I was a kid, my aunt's American, and she came over to visit, and she was like, yeah, we're going to, like, American pancakes. And I was like, I love American pancakes. Maple syrup, who doesn't love that? And she's like, and throw some bacon on top of it. And I'm like, aunt, you've lost your f***ing mind. What? That's bacon. Why would you put it on there with maple syrup and sweet pancakes? You, f y are you batshit insane? And she's like, just do it. Just try it. And I have loved it to this very day. I love it. It's an incredible combination that the Americans absolutely got correct. All of this just works. 
It's not, I'm not kidding. I assume that there must be a long and proud tradition of serving marshmallow blobs on Thanksgiving Day, delving right back into the historic roots of the US. Perhaps the New Pilgrims and the Wampanoag Apologies, Native American tribe were all munching away on marshmallow casserole way back on what is widely seen as the first major Thanksgiving celebration at Plymouth Rock in 1621. But no, they probably had a much more grown up menu. The true origins of the marshmallow casserole can be found in the marketing tactics of a German and a couple of German immigrant brothers. Sweet potatoes have been on the Thanksgiving table since the 19th century, but marshmallows were difficult and expensive to produce at the time. They had a reputation as a fancy food for the wealthy. After moving to America, the German brothers. Frederick and Louis Ruchelm busy inventing the famous Cracker Jacks brand. They later turned their attention to mass producing their Angelus marshmallows for the everyday customer for the first time at the turn of the 20th century when advertisers began targeting American housewives with new lazy ass convenience foods such as gelatin salad and canned pumpkin. Oh, that made my mouth like water, in, but in the bad way. Not in the good way. The Rochem brothers figured that they could do something similar with marshmallows. What well, can them? In gelatin, you weirdos. They hired Janet Mackenzie Hill, the founder of Boston Cooking School magazine, to put together a little recipe booklet in 1917, which was shrewdly designed to get the home cook to fully embrace marshmallows as a versatile kitchen ingredient which could be shoved in your hot drinks and sprinkled over your savory dinners. Did an incredible job of the marketing on this one, boys. According to the Library of Context, Library of Context, that could be a good thing, but I did mean the Library of Congress. It was the very same booklet that first depicted sweet potatoes with a marshmallow topping, a side serving which was destined to become a thoroughly American tradition on the Thanksgiving table, alongside the cranberry sauce and cocaine and scotch eggs. Hell yeah! But this thoroughly American tradition was the brazen result of a German-born marketing stunt inspired by the notion that Americans can be convinced to eat any old sh Next Thanksgiving, you might as well shove a couple of bratwurst sausages onto your plate and drench them in custard. Oh, Danny, again, my mouth is watering, but in the wrong ways. Coffee on the go. An American tourist visiting Britain for the first time might be surprised at how few people they see guzzling down large plastic cups of coffee on the streets while rushing to make their next appointments. Over here, we tend to sit down at the Starbucks table and soak up the coffee experience in sharp contrast to America, where the citizens clearly don't have time to muck about and have more of a tendency to order coffee to go. Which is why they have a more productive economy. <laughs> and in fact, this opens up a whole bubbling pot of worms on how the UK and the US take very different approaches to enjoying a hot beverage. Yes, we're talking about hot coffee here in America. Put those ice cubes away. Bloody hell. It could be argued that America has developed a much more efficient strategy for consuming food and drink during a working day. Whilst the UK might view this as an opportunity to take a welcome short break to savor with friends and colleagues, Americans are more likely to save time by multitasking. They'll just shovel that stuff into their mouths whilst making the next step of their journey, or they'll eat their lunch at their desk while they carry on working. Do you think Mukbang, the first YouTuber to try this, was actually like really busy and they were like, well, I'm just going to eat lunch at my desk while making videos. And people were like, I love it! Eat more while you make videos! <laughs> Thinking about it, I'm be I feel like I'm quite efficient because I eat like a meal replacement shake. There's a company that makes them. I've shown them before. And... I love them. I just, I, you shake it up, it takes like two minutes, and then you eat the, you just drink this thing, and it takes like two minutes, and lunch is done. And I just realized maybe I could be more efficient by just doing these videos, but we'd also have lunch. So I'd order a burger, we could eat this, we could blaze together. Or I could just start a straight mukbang channel. That way I could monetize all my meals. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Brilliant. Done. Coming soon. <laughs> Stop it. Get some help. It's also worth noting that American drink sizes are absolutely massive, so you might not always have time to slurp it all down inside the coffee shop. And if you've purchased it from a place that offers those magic free refills, then you might as well get your cup topped up before leaving the joint and getting on with the rest of your day. But there's another interesting point to consider, of which I was not fully aware until today. Back in the days when my own long commute to the workplace involved more than just shuffling to the other end of a dank basement, I would never have considered buying a coffee on the way to work. I would have just made myself a cup of instant coffee at home before I set off. I get it. I mean, when I was a student, I worked and it was like a little 20 minute drive to where I was like working. And I had like a thermos flask, like, you know, one of those thermos cups, and I'd always make a ridiculously strong instant coffee in there. And I don't do that anymore. I'm not really sure why. I guess because I get to work pretty fast and then I have a coffee machine at work and I just get cracking with it. And also, I'm quite keen to get to work. Whereas in the past, like, as I go into a job, and you're like, oh, okay, I'll sit in the car for 20 minutes. At least I can enjoy this coffee. Also, there wasn't a Starbucks nearby. It saves a bit of time and hassle and a lot of money. Yeah, also, when you're getting paid like, well, it wasn't minimum wage, I was making like, I don't know, eight, nine quid an hour or something. Yeah, when you're going to Starbucks, you're like four pounds, you're like, that's half an hour's work. 
Uh-uh. <laughs> no. Loads of UK workers would do exactly the same thing. Why can't Americans keep it this simple? Because Americans generally don't do instant coffee. Oh, I didn't know that. Instant coffee's like it's not good. I, I my thing with instant coffee is I like instant coffee, but it's not, I don't really see it as coffee. And I think a lot of people are like, oh, this coffee's rubbish. God, this coffee smells like shit. Just don't view it as coffee. See it as like another coffee tasting caffeinated hot beverage, and then it's like it's quite good. Like I genuinely enjoy it. Think that's good? Is it not? No. It's quite surprising that whilst the rest of the world is addicted to instant coffee, the fast living land of super convenience and ready sliced carrots just don't care for that stuff at all. And whilst they may prefer to piss about brewing the real thing at home, they're not always going to have enough time during the breakfast routine, which is why grabbing a coffee to go on the way becomes the more appealing option. Perhaps they could instead dunk a tea bag into a cup at the breakfast table, but of course Americans aren't so hot on tea either. It's weird Americans aren't into instant coffee. Also, coffee in America at home, like, you guys are responsible for the percolator, right? And you guys still use that, because that thing's a monstrosity. Just use a filter coffee machine or a, a French press. Come on. I don't want to sound like a snob, but what the f percolators? It's not right. Get rid of it. America used to be a nation of tea drinkers in the 17th and 18th centuries and largely ignored the first arrival of newfangled coffee to their shores in 1607. But all of this changed in 1773 when the colonists revolted against Britain's fair taxation. Sonsy. <laughs> it says unfair. <laughs> <laughs> but I throw that in just to be spicy. Unfair taxations on tea leading to the Boston Tea Party, which saw 342 chests of British tea getting dumped into Boston Harbor and a subsequent 10-year boycott on unpatriotic tea. But I still think it's worth giving instant coffee another try, America. If you really must, take a kettle with you on your way to work and boil it on the go. They do make kettles for the car, which is quite something. <laughs> Cheese dreams. We're obviously having to make a few sweeping generalizations here. I'm not trying to suggest that Americans have never tasted real cheese, but where is a good UK grocery store is stuffed full of proper tr uh, traditional crumbly cheeses oozing with flavor? You don't get nearly as much choice in America, and a good cheese is apparently much harder to track down. Really? I always assumed that Americans just went for that weird sliced cheese because it was like cheap and convenient, but I assumed that there was like also good cheese in the supermarket. Right? No? We can learn a lot from what is typically described as American cheese. A British county or town is proud to have its name associated with a mighty fine cheese. For example, real cheddar is produced in the Somerset Village using centuries-old cheddaring methods to age it to perfection and create an elastic texture, texture and an earthy, pungent flavor. In contrast, American cheese describes those individually wrapped slices of plasticky, orange, plasticky glowing orange wax squares that you either shove on top of a hamburger or smear across your window frames to provide cheap insulation. <laughs> Mate, it is not even cheese. And the FDA, FDA agrees. Really? On the ground that when a product contains 51% of additional ingredients, it's no longer the original product. These pasteurized prepared cheese products are full of concert, concentrates, preservatives, and colorings, or other than anything a cow might recognize. But while it's true that processed cheese can be found just about everywhere in the world, America did become strangely fascinated with the stuff throughout the 20th century, to the point where it became so obsessed with concocting criminally convenient creamy corruptions, it lost scent of the real deal. Though processed cheese was officially invented by Swiss scientist Walter Gerber in 1911, it was James. James L. Kraft, as in Kraft Kraft, who shrewdly grabbed the American patent for his own processing method in 1916, and who much later introduced the world to his Im strange embalmed cheese sing singles in the 1950s. Did he really call it embalmed? Because I don't feel that's really a selling point. It's like it's embalmed. What do I associate embalmed with? Well, mostly death and the weird preservation of bodies. But the first sign of America's milk really taking a wrong turn was with Kraft's launch of Cheese Whiz in 1942. This was a spread this was spreadable cheese in a jar, dude. No. Designed for the super busy homemaker who didn't even have time to slice or grate a real block of cheese. I say spreadable cheese. Nobody really knows how much cheese, if any, goes into a jar of the purposefully misspelt Cheese Whiz. Oh, C H E E Z. W H I Z Z. Or if you're American, C H E E Z, <laughs> W H I Z Z. <laughs> Apparently, a retired craft food scientist who helped to develop the stuff claims that the original recipe included real cheese, but when he later purchased a jar in 2001, he was dismayed to find that it now tasted like axle grease. Dude, why would you know what axle grease tastes like? And after pursuing the 27 listed ingredients on the label, he was even more displayed to find that, dismayed to find that not one of them uh, was actually cheese. Bonus tip, if you don't fancy eating that jar of cheese whiz in the cupboard, it's remarkably effective for getting rid of grease and oil stains from your work overalls. No, it's not, is it really? But by far the biggest crime to be committed in the name of cheese is the abomination that goes under the name 
easy cheese. Squirty cheese sludge, which can be sprayed directly into your mouth from a can. Oh, I've seen this. This is in like movies and stuff. Whenever they want to just portray someone as a slob, they're eating this cheese spray direct from the can. Like <laughs> which is disgusting. Originally launched in the States as Snack Mate in 1965 by Nabisco, the early advertising campaigns illustrated how easy it was to use cheese in a can to make instant canapes for real happening cocktail parties. <laughs> that's some like, I don't know, like that's a cocktail party at a trailer. <laughs> Kraft eventually swallowed up the product in 1984 when it was rebranded as Easy Cheese and marketed more as dude food for the man with no shame. Exactly. That's how it's portrayed in movies. It's not like some fancy dinner party where they're serving Ferrero Rocher in a giant pile and cheese was squirted from a can. <laughs> I just can't help feeling that proper cheese is already relatively easy. We don't need to stoop this low. It's only one small step away from canned squirty gravy. Actually, no, I'd buy that. However, it seems in more recent years, America has finally turned away from squirty cheese, spreadable cheese, and even single cheese slices. A sale of all such stomach-curdling products have tumbled to an all-time low. It could be the case that America is finally coming around to the idea of putting the aerosol can down and sampling a taste of real artisan cheese that isn't stuffed with crap. Hope springs eternal. Give it another 50 years and they'll be drinking proper fizzy lemonade i'm absolutely sure of it thank you danny this has been an episode of brain blaze thank you so much for watching and i'll see you next time